Carbohydrates are the most abundant organic molecules in nature. They have a wide range of functions, such as providing a significant portion of dietary calories for most organisms, acting as a storage form of energy in the body, serving as cell membrane components, and mediate cell signaling. Today, we will cover the following six topics centered around glycolysis. Let's start with carbohydrates digestion. Common dietary carbohydrates include lactose, sucrose, and starch. Lactose and sucrose are disaccharides. Lactose is found in milk. Here is lactose. Two monosaccharides. Galactose and glucose are joined together by beta-1,4 glycosidic bond. Similar to a peptide or nucleic acid, two ends here are different. The ends that contains a free anomeric carbon is the reducing end. The end that does not contain a free anomeric carbon is the non-reducing end. Sucrose is found at high amount in sugar canes or sugar beets. Here is the sucrose. Two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose are joined together by alpha beta 1,2 glycosidic bond. Because Two anomeric carbons are involved in glycosidic bonds. Sucrose is not a reducing sugar. Most important dietary carbohydrates is starch. It is derived from plants. Two main components of starch are amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is composed of long chains of D-glucose residues that are linked together with alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond in a linear fashion. Amylopectin is composed of branch chains of D-glucose residues that are linked by alpha-1,4 linkage in the chains and by alpha-1,6 linkage at the branch point. Digestion of carbohydrates begins in the mouth. In the mouth, alpha amylase randomly hydrolyzes the starch to dextrins. Dextrins are glucose polymers with fewer than 10 glucose residues. In the intestine, pancreatic alpha amylase continue to hydrolyze dextrins to disaccharides, maltose and isomaltose. Finally, specific enzymes cleave disaccharides to two monosaccharides. You may notice all these disaccharides contain at least one glucose residue. The second monosaccharide is different. Here, lac may help you link it with galactose. Wu may help you link with fructose. Human cannot digest cellulose because it contains beta-1,4 linkage, and human enzyme cannot cut this glycosidic bond. Here is clinical correlation. Lactose intolerance is a very common condition since more than half of Boer's adult population has lactose intolerance. It is caused by reduced expression of lactase due to DNA methylation or loss of lactase at all due to genetic mutation of the lactase gene. Lactate deficiency leads to buildup of lactose. Bacteria then start to ferment lactose, leading to gas. This is why patients experience abdominal bloating cramps, flatulence, 
Other symptoms include diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Treatment involves dietary restriction or take lactase in the pill form. Now let's move to part two. Group one and group three mediate basal glucose uptake in most tissue, including brain, nerves, and red blood cells. Their features are low KM and low Vmax. Group two is more specifically found in hepatocytes and pancreatic beta cells. It features high KM and high Vmax. In pancreatic beta cells, GLUT2, along with glucokinase, serves as a glucose sensor for insulin release. GLUT4 is produced in muscle and edible tissue. The number of GLUT4 on the plasma membrane is controlled by insulin. Without insulin signaling, for example, the GLUT4 is found in cytoplasmic vesicles. When insulin signaling arrives, group 4 is located on the cell membrane. This is a high yield topic. Here is a summary of group 1 to group 4. These four glucose transporters are our focus. There are three more glucose transporters. Out of these three, Sodium-dependent glucose co-transporter co-transport glucose and sodium in the same direction. This co-transporter is required for absorption of glucose in the intestine and reabsorption of glucose in the kidney. Now, let's move to part 3. Glycolysis is a cytoplasmic pathway that converts glucose into two pyruvate molecules, releasing a modest amount of energy. Here, there are two pieces of information I need to point out. First, this pathway functions in the cytoplasm. Second, energy is captured in two substrate-level phosphorylation and one oxidation reactions. Glycolysis can be roughly divided into two phases. The first phase is to process glucose and get it ready for cleavage. This phase is coincided with energy investment. Second phase is to cleave glucose, convert it to three carbon intermediates, and extract energy. This phase is coincided with energy generation. Important products include high-energy compounds, such as NADH, ATP. In the first phase, glucose is phosphorylated at two positions. The first phosphate group is added at position 6. Structure rearrangement leads to fructose 6-phosphate. Then at second phosphate group, at position 1. Now the two ends of the molecule are quite equivalent. Enzyme comes in and break this compound in the middle into two compounds, each with three carbon. Blue part gives rise to an aldehyde and pink part gives rise to a ketone. These two products are not only in the same size, but also interchangeable, mediated by enzymes. Therefore, you can treat these two compounds as two aldehyde or two ketones. Two steps of phosphorylation here require investment of two ATP. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is a high-energy compound. In the second phase, this compound undergoes an oxidation and transfer reaction to generate two high-energy compounds. One is NADH, another one is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 
This is followed by two transfer reactions, in which phosphate group is transferred to ADP, giving rise to ATP. These two reactions are also called substrate level phosphorylation. It happened here and here. Today, we will focus on five energy-related steps. This is the first energy investment step. It phosphorylates glucose at the position 6. It is an irreversible and rate-limiting step. Phosphorylation traps glucose inside the cell. This reaction is catalyzed by two enzymes, glucokinase and hexokinase. Glucokinase is found in liver and pancreatic beta cells. Hexokinase is found in most tissues. There are some differences in kinetics between these two enzymes. Glucokinase has higher Km and higher Vmax. As shown here, glucokinase have higher Vmax and higher Km. In contrast, hexokinase has a lower Vmax and lower Km. These differences determined hexokinase mediates basal glucose phosphorylation reaction. Glucokinase works more robustly when the glucose concentration is high, such as in fat state. As I described to you earlier, glucokinase together with GLUT2 serve as a glucose sensor. Glucokinase determines the ratio of ATP to ADP. This is pancreatic beta cell. High ATP close the potassium channel and the membrane depolarize. This leads to opening of a calcium channel. Entries of calcium triggers insulin release. Here is a clinical correlation. Maturity onset diabetes of the young type 2 is caused by mutation in the glucokinase gene. These two enzymes are subject to control in three ways. First, hexokinase is an allosteric enzyme. It is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, the product. Glucokinase is not subject to this coagulation. In contrast, glucokinase is controlled by two other ways. First, it can be sequestered by a regulatory protein and kept in an inactive state. Second, the transcription of glucokinase gene is controlled by insulin and glucagon. Insulin increases transcription and glucagon repress the transcription of the gene. The second phosphorylation reaction is catalyzed by PFK1 or phosphofructokinase 1. This is the most important control point of glycolysis. Here is clinical correlation. Tarrhe's disease is caused by deficiency of muscle PFK1. Patients cannot utilize glycogen in the muscle. Glycolysis is a very important energy source during exercise. PFK1 deficiency leads to exercise-induced muscle cramps and weakness, hemolytic anemia in glycogen deposit. PFK1, PFK2, and FBP2 are subject to three types of regulation. First, PFK1 is an allosteric enzyme. It is activated by fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and inhibited by citrate and ATP. Second, in the liver, insulin activates PFK2 by dephosphorylation. Glucagon activates FBP2 by phosphorylation. When insulin level is high, PFK2 is active a FBP2 level is high. This compound activates PFK1 
in glycolysis is robust. Vice versa, when glucagon level is high, FBP2 is activated, and fructose 26 bisphosphate level is low, glycolysis is not stimulated. Third, insulin and glucagon control transcription of PFK1 gene. Insulin increases transcription of PFK1 gene and glucagon replaces it. In fact, PFK2 and FBP2 are two enzymes on one polypeptide, which is called bifunctional enzyme. When this protein is phosphorylated, PFK2 is inactive, but FBP2 is active. FBP2 degrades fructose 26 bisphosphate. Glycolysis is not stimulated. When this protein is dephosphorylated, PFK2 now is active, but FBP2 is inactive. PFK2 synthesizes fructose 26 bisphosphate from fructose 6 phosphate. This compound stimulates glycolysis. Therefore, phosphorylation serves as a switch to control the activity of these two enzymes. Then, what controls phosphorylation of this protein? It is insulin and glucagon signaling here. Yeah. For example, during starvation, glucagon signaling is strong. This protein is phosphorylated. Fructose 26 bisphosphate is not made. Glycolysis then is not stimulated. During fat state, insulin signaling is strong. This protein is dephosphorylated. Fructose 26 bisphosphate is made. Glycolysis is stimulated. Regulation of PFK2 and FBP2 by insulin and glucagon is summarized on this slide. The enzyme glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase or GAPDH catalyze both oxidoreduction and transfer reactions. The oxidation reaction converts aldehyde to acid with production of NADH. The transfer reaction leads to transfer of an inorganic phosphate to the carboxyl group resulting 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate or 1,3-BPG. Both NADH and 1,3-BPG are high-energy compounds. NADH can be oxidized to produce ATP through electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. 1,3-BPG will directly yield ATP through substrate level phosphorylation that we will discuss on the next slide. This step has clinical correlation. Arsenite competes with inorganic phosphate to bind to this enzyme. As a substrate, forming a complex that spontaneously hydrolyzes to form 3 phosphoglycerate without any ATP being produced. It is the reduced ATP production that eventually kills the cell. In this step, phosphate is transferred from high-energy compound 1,3-BPG to ATP, giving rise to ATP. After loss of phosphate, 1,3-BPG is converted to 3-phosphoglycerate. This is the first substrate-level phosphorylation reaction, yielding 2 ATP. Second, in red blood cells, 1,3-BPG can be converted to 2,3-BPG. 
This compound promotes the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. In this step, phosphate is transferred from phosphoenol pyruvate or PEP to ADP, giving rise to ATP. This step has two features. First, it is irreversible and rate limiting step. Second, this is a second substrate level phosphorylation reaction. Till now, we have a net gain of 2 ATP and 2 NADH. Here is a clinical correlation. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is the second most common genetic deficiency that causes hemolytic anemia after G6PD deficiency. Characteristics include chronic hemolysis, increased 2,3 BPG in the blood, absence of Heinz bodies. Hemolysis is caused by reduced ATP production. One direct outcome is splenomegaly. Increased 2,3 BPG decreased oxygen binding affinity of hemoglobin. Pyruvate kinase is also subject to three types of regulation. First, pyruvate kinase is an allosteric enzyme. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, the product of PFK1, activates this enzyme. Acetyl-CoA and ATP inactivates this enzyme. Second, similar to glucokinase and PFK2, insulin activate this enzyme by dephosphorylation. Glucagon inhibit this enzyme by phosphorylation. Third, similar to glucokinase and PFK1, insulin increases and glucagon represses the transcription of the pyruvate kinase gene. Pyruvate can be converted to lactate under an anaerobic condition. This step consumes NADH and replenish NAD. This reaction primarily occurs in anaerobic glycolysis, but it also occurs in red blood cells, lens, corneas, kidney, medulla, testes, leukocytes. It also occurs in alcoholics. This is a summary. Glycolysis is irreversible because of three irreversible steps. Important intermediates include dihydroacetone phosphate or DHAP equivalent to 1,3 BPG. DHAP is used in liver and adipose tissue for triglyceride synthesis. 1,3 BPG and phosphoenol pyruvate are high energy compound used to generate ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. One feature of biochemistry is integration. Pyruvate is an excellent example. Pyruvate can be converted to lactate, and pyruvate can also be converted to alanine through transamination. Pyruvate can be oxidized to acetyl-CoA through pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate also can be carboxylated to OAA through carboxylase. Under anaerobic glycolysis, pyruvate is converted to lactate with net gain of only 2 ATP. Under an aerobic condition, glycolysis has net gain of 2 ATP and 2 NADH. NADH is produced in the cytoplasm it should be transported to mitochondria for electron transport chain. However, the inner membrane of mitochondria is impermeable to NADH. Therefore, we need two shuttles. The first shuttle is glycerol phosphate shuttle. Energy from NADH is transferred to glycerol 3 phosphate. This compound can easily cross mitochondria membrane and arrive in the matrix 
where it is reoxidized to DHAP. I mentioned to you earlier, a energy is released in the form of FADH2, which goes through electron transport chain. Dihydroacetone phosphate can come back to the cytoplasm. Second shuttle is malate aspartic shuttle. Energy from NADH is transferred to malate. Malate can easily cross the mitochondrial membrane and arrive in the matrix, where it is reoxidized to oxaloacetate. To recycle oxaloacetate, it needs to work with glutamate through transamination. This gives rise to aspartic and alpha-ketoglutarate, which can cross the mitochondrial membrane and come back to the cytoplasm. After they arrive in cytoplasm, they are converted back to oxaloacetate and glutamate through transamination again. Here is integration with physiology. Red blood cells have bisphosphoglycerate mutase, which produce 2,3-BPG from 1,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG reduces the affinity of hemoglobin A for oxygen. Here is an oxygen binding curve, and this curve represents hemoglobin A alone. Addition of 2,3-BPG causes the curve to shift to the right. 2,3-BPG binds hemoglobin A more tightly than hemoglobin F. As a result, hemoglobin F has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin A. Now, let's move to part 4. Major dietary source for fructose is sucrose. Similar to glucose, to break down fructose, it needs to be phosphorylated first. Fructokinase is the main enzyme that directly phosphorylates fructose at position 1. This enzyme is found in liver, kidney, and small intestine. In glycolysis, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate can be cleaved by three enzymes, aldolase A, B, and C. In contrast, fructose 1-phosphate can only be cleaved by aldolase B. Adolase A is expressed in most tissues. Adolase B is found in liver, and adolase C is found in the brain. The rate of fructose metabolism is faster than glucose because it only needs to be phosphorylated once before it is cleaved, which bypass PFK1 step. Here is clinical correlation. Fructokinase deficiency cause essential fructose urea. Adolase B deficiency cause hereditary fructose intolerance. Although in both conditions, fructose builds up in the blood, their clinical outcomes are very different. Essential fructose urea is a benign condition. Hereditary fructose intolerance, on the other hand, is a very severe condition. It features three H, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, and hepatomegaly. Deficiency in aldolase B leads to trapping of phosphate in fructose 1-phosphate. In the absence of phosphate, cells are unable to synthesize ATP, a AMP level rise. Without ATP, Liver cannot synthesize glucose and proteins, leading to hypoglycemia and hepatomegaly. Without phosphate available, AMP is degraded, causing hyperuricemia. Many tissues can convert glucose to sorbitol because these tissues express aldolase reductase but only a very few tissues can further convert sorbitol to fructose. Among them are liver, ovary, and testes. 
in uncontrolled diabetes arise in the intracellular glucose concentration, cause a rise in the intracellular sorbitol level. In tissues such as lens, nerve, and kidney, where sorbitol dehydrogenase is absent or very low, sorbitol builds up. This has a strong osmotic effect, causing cell swelling. This is the mechanism for cataract formation in uncontrolled diabetes patients. Now let's move to part 5. Major dietary source for galactose is lactose. Similar to fructose, galactose must be phosphorylated before it is metabolized. This step is catalyzed by galactokinase, which produce galacto-1-phosphate. Different from fructose, galactose-1-phosphate cannot enter glycolytic pathways unless it is first converted to UDP galactose. This occurs in an exchange reaction. UDP glucose reacts with galacto-1-phosphate to produce UDP galactose and glucose-1-phosphate. This reaction is catalyzed by galactose-1-phosphate uridia transferase, or GALT. Here is a clinical correlation. Galactokinase deficiency causes buildup of galactose in the blood and urine. Some galactose is further converted to galactitol. Elevated galactitol can cause cataract formation in a manner similar to sorbitol. On the other hand, the transferase GALT deficiency causes classic galactosemia that has more severe clinical outcome. Besides buildup of galactose and galactitol, phosphate is also trapped in galactose 1-phosphate. In the absence of phosphate, cells cannot synthesize ATP, a AMP level rise. Without ATP, liver cannot synthesize glucose and proteins, leading to hypoglycemia and hepatomegaly. Elevated galactitol cause cataract. So far, we have seen three diseases related to monosaccharide metabolism that have hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. They are summarized in one mnemonic. GAP. It stands for three enzymes, GALT, adolase B, and pyruvate kinase, deficiency of which can cause hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. Now, let's move to part six. Pyruvate is the final product of aerobic glycolysis. In the next step, Pyruvate is decarboxylated and converted to acetyl-CoA. If sufficient energy is present, acetyl-CoA may be used to synthesize fatty acids. If ATP is needed, acetyl-CoA can enter TCA cycle to be oxidized to generate energy. Decarboxylation of pyruvate is catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is a complex of five enzymes, E1, E2, E3, plus two regulatory proteins, PDH kinase and PDH phosphatase. It requires five coenzymes. The entire reaction can be divided by five steps. In step one, pyruvate is decarboxylated to form a hydroxyethyl derivative bound to thymine, the coenzyme of E1. In step 2, the hydroxyethyl intermediate is oxidized by transfer to the disulfide form of lipoic acid, covalently bound to E2. In step 3, the acetyl group bound as a thioester to the side chains of lipoic acid is transferred to coenzyme A. 
In step four, sulfhydryl form of lipoic acid is oxidized by E3, and lipoic acid is regenerated. In step five, FADH2 is reoxidized to FAD by E3 as NAD is reduced. These are the five coenzymes summarized in one mnemonic. Tender loving care for Nancy. Primary regulation for pyruvate dehydrogenase is through phosphorylation by PDH kinase and phosphatase. PDH kinase reduces the PDH activity by phosphorylation. PDH phosphatase increases the PDH activity by dephosphorylation. This is very similar to pyruvate kinase in which phosphorylation inhibits the enzyme activity and dephosphorylation increases enzyme activity. Calcium activates PDH phosphatase. Pyruvate NAD inhibit PDH kinase. Therefore, these three compounds all activate the pyruvate dehydrogenase. NADH, acetyl-CoA, and ATP allosterically activate PDH kinase. Therefore, they inhibit the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Second mechanism is acetyl-CoA and NADH inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase directly as a competitive inhibitors. Here is a clinical correlation. Pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency leads to accumulation of pyruvate and lactic acid and decrease in acetyl-CoA and ATP production. This is the most common cause of congenital lactic acidosis. Reduced ATP production accounts for hypotonia, poor feeding, and lethargy in newborns. Buildup of lactic acid leads to lactic acidosis.